You want me to put that on my todger? Harry's wife. Their folly adieu. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. An interesting article from Julie Birchill in The Spectator, which talks about the folly adieu. I've made mention of this on numerous occasions when it comes to Harry and Harry's wife and explained in my video their awful shared fantasy of how Harry's, Harry's wife, the deluded narcissist, operates within her own fantasy world. This is a world where she is the most important being in the universe. This is a world where everything revolves around her. It is a world where people are expected to admire her, support her, praise her, be amazed by her. It is a world where every man is meant to want to slip her a crippler and that every woman wants to be like her. It's a world where she wears fashion as the fashion icon she believes herself to be. It is a world where anybody who speaks badly of her is clearly a raving lunatic with a foam-flecked mouth and the swivelled eyes of a bigot. Anybody that speaks contrary to her creed is damned as a hater and a racist. It's a world where everybody should do what she wants, agree with what she says, listen to what she has to say. A world where her speeches are applauded, that her ideas are vaunted as the most progressive ideas heard in the history of ever. It's a world where she is a brilliant writer, statesperson, burgeoning politician and entrepreneur. It's a world where she is a perfect mother, but also a strong independent feminist. It's a world where she came from a poor background, except when she didn't come from a poor background. It was a world where she crawled out of the back of cars and persuaded Procter & Gamble to change their advertising campaign single-handedly. It's a world where she grew up as an only child, save when she chooses that she didn't do so. It's a world where she knew nothing about the royal family and nothing about Prince Harry until such time as she did know something about them. It's a world where she says she was treated to racism by the royal family, except when she says that she wasn't treated to racism by the royal family. It's a world where it's her against the world that still ought to be admiring her and worshipping her. It's a world where the normal conventions that you believe would be applicable to what you understand in the world are not applicable, because it's all seen through her narcissistic perspective. Ordinarily, such a view results in difficulties because it clashes with the worldview and perspectives of other people. However, certain narcissists are able, through charisma, rhetoric, and being a demagogue, accord other people to accept their views. Notably, these are individuals who are leaders of cults, spiritual gurus, dictators, heads of totalitarian states, leaders of particular political parties, who are able to resonate with such individuals that they accept that their worldview of the narcissist is an appropriate one to follow and adhere to. In some instances, they might not agree with everything, but they agree with the majority. And that's how we end up with the true believer that leads those followers. In other instances, the narcissist creates that bubble of fantasy into which they draw one person, the intimate partner primary source, that that person shares in the delusion, somebody who is easy to brainwash, easy to control, somebody who's malleable in that manner. That person here is Prince Harry, a primary victim who is easy to control, who stood out so readily to Harry's wife's narcissism as somebody that could be manipulated, controlled, who fountains with fuel, provides lots of residual benefits and character traits, and can be brainwashed to the extent that he also believes in the delusion that she adheres to.
He doesn't see the delusion in the way that she does. She has that deluded worldview as a consequence of her narcissism. But he shares in it because of his emotional thinking, low cognitive function and the manipulations that he's subjected to on a near daily basis. He's told how to think. He's told what to do. He's told where to be. He's told how he should see the rest of the world. He's told how the rest of the world sees him. And in order to maintain involved with this individual that he's essentially cunt struck by and riven to a point of infatuation to his own emotional thinking, he agrees. There'll be instances where he recognises certain things that she says aren't quite right. And also, of course, he'll be on the receiving end of corrective devaluations, or rather a sustained devaluation. But the point is, it isn't sufficient to drive him away because it isn't at the point of disengagement, nor is it at the point whereby he's moved to escape. Instead, her hold over him remains as tight as ever, alongside, of course, his own emotional thinking. He subscribes to her delusion. He adheres to her fantasy and has entered that folly of duh. But what is it that Julie Birchall has to say? Has she recognised it in similar terms in the way that I have described? Let us find out. She writes, I was interested to read that the next Joker film has the subtitle Folly a deux, a lovely phrase not used enough these days. When shrinks talk about folly a deux, known as la Seguille Falleray syndrome, after the 19th century French psychiatrist who discovered it, they mean a shared delusional disorder in which symptoms of an irrational belief are transmitted from one individual, from Harry's wife, to another, to Prince Harry, including folly en famille or folly à plusieurs, madness of several, sometimes leading to violence and even murder. But in popular culture, we generally mean a pair of lovers who act in such a way that anyone outside their setup sees them as insane, folly of two, or madness shared by two, and who provides a great deal of entertainment and reassurance for those who have chosen a tamer path. Folly adeurs can involve psychopaths, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, Bonnie and Clyde, doomed lover, doomed lovers Sid and Nancy, Kurt and Courtney, or imminently antagonistic narcissists, Depp and Heard, Madonna and Penn. But they will share the sense of being the only two citizens of a state which is invisible to the rest of us, with its own language and rules. This was never more powerfully and pitifully portrayed than in the 1994 film Heavenly Creatures, based on 1950s New Zealand schoolgirls Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume. Their intense friendship culminated in the murder of Parker's mother, who was seen as being in the way, threat to control, of their continuing relationship. The psychiatrist Reginald Medlicott wrote a study of the case entitled Paranoia of the Exalted Type in a Setting of a Folia Da, in which he argued that the girl's shared fantasy, the girl's shared fantasy world, exacerbated the state of mind that led to the murder. Each acted on the other as a resonator, increasing the pitch of their narcissism. At the time, Heavenly Creatures was released appropriately, or inappropriately. I was about to embark on a folly adieu of my own, when as a married woman I took up with a 25-year-old girl. The Guardian's film critic Peter Bradshaw wrote of my relationship with Charlotte Raven, the affair was very possibly partly inspired by seeing heavenly creatures. I like to think that it was, in some gloriously liberated sense, an, act, an inspired act of criticism itself, a passionate flesh and blood real life response to Jackson's film. Sadly, they don't make folly or dirt like they used to. A king once gave up a throne for an American divorcee and lived a life of globe trotting shame. Now, a prince gives up thrice weekly visits to Knocker's nightclub for American divorcee and lives a life of globe-trotting blame. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex are surely the best current example of the folly of duh, which fascinates us partly because of the comedy goal to be mined in the gaping chasm between what the people involved believe they look like, fearless fighters for freedom and justice, and how they appear to the rest of us, two spiteful toddlers attempting to be bosses of a sandpit. What's especially interesting about the folly of the Sussexes is that before they got together, they both seemed perfectly okay. She would never win an Oscar. 
and he would never be begged to leave his brain to science. But they were jogging along, having a laugh and not bothering everyone, anyone. Well, I wouldn't say that was entirely accurate because, of course, Harry's wife as a narcissist was bothering other people, members of her family, Trevor Engelson, Corey the chef, and so forth. What she wasn't doing was bothering people on a worldwide scale, as she does now. Virgil continues, As I wrote in The Spectator last year, people always say soulmates, like it's a good thing, but such relationships can easily turn toxic. As I've explained to you before, the use of soulmates is a narcissistic indicator. Individually, Harry and Harry's wife seemed happy enough, neither of them too bright, but both living lush lifestyles they didn't have to break sweat for. Then they met, and it was attempted murder of the reputation of the royal family. Seeing that the pair are so interested in mental health, I wonder if they understand that they may be, in my layman's opinion, suffering from both paranoia and persecution complex, and it might be wise to seek professional help. How do folliadeurs end? Usually badly. One of the partners in crime snaps out of it, as happened with Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, and sees the antics of the other as no longer fascinating but unhinged. Ironically, the person still afflicted can't believe that the escapee is in their right mind and do all kinds of elaborate things to get them back, hoovering, which in West's case included making a video of himself burying alive an animated version of his wife's boyfriend. The phrase, a lucky escape, will oft be heard. Occasionally, a folie d'eau will mature into something lovely and the wayward pair grow into a devoted couple, Keith Richards and Patty Hansen, and especially poignantly John Lydon and Nora Foster. Angelina Jolie once bought the folie like no other, but her higher calling has left former playmates bemused. The folie de has downgraded throughout the years, from Abelard and Heloise through Scott and Zelda to Taylor and Burton, and most recently to those pale copies of Jolie and her second husband, Billy Bob Thornton, right down to the vials of blood worn as necklaces, but they claim to drink it too, the actress Megan Fox and her rock star beau Machine Gun Kelly. The progression of their relationship is a salutary lesson to any young lovers tempted to take a walk on the wild side, once prone to comparing their union to being in love with a forest fire, and proudly wearing a whopping great Stephen Webster engagement ring set on two actual bands of thorns. So if she tries to take it off, it hurts. Love is pain. Fox is now complaining that she wants to get to know Machine Gun for who he is, according to a friend. A clue may come in the fact that the preposterous pair have been together for two years, this being the modern milestone which has replaced the seven-year itch, or, as you would understand through my work, usually the end of the golden period, as the point where the previously lovable little ways of one's half, one's other half, make one feel quite like cleaving them into halves. Most romances start to some extent as folie a deux, during which some valentine red mist descends and we insist on seeing a profoundly unremarkable individual as a creature from a realm of wonder. Is there any more unhinged idea that for all of us, on a planet of billions, there is only the one? And of course, that's the narcissistic mindset at work. It's easy for a folie a deux to become an amour fou, and that literally lies the way of madness. But like many things, a folie d'eur is painful to live through, but lots of fun to look back on. Who would really want a cavalcade of memories in which love always wrapped up warm and didn't swim after drinking? Not me. In the words of Robert Browning, borrowed by Dame Joan Collins for her splendid memoir, Past Imperfect, how sad and bad and mad it was, but then how it was sweet. Some very useful observations there from... Julie Birchill, identifying the nature of the madness that's created and the way that with this folie de Harry and Harry's wife, she has dragged him in and created this fantasy world, as I've explained, where it really isn't going to end in a happy outcome for him. It's unlikely that he will break away and far more likely that she will disengage from him, bringing to an end the folie de as she then seeks out an alternative one. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.